start on this side, please. Thank you so much for um, this discussion. I think this is really the cutting edge of originalism, so I, I really do enjoy this. Um, my question is for Professor Fisher. Um, I find myself more on your side on these issues as I studied them, and um, my, my question is, um, how does forfeiture by wrongdoing fit into the original understanding of um, confrontation clause, um, the original understanding of the confrontation clause? So, so the, 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 the question uh, for people in the audience, the forfeiture doctrine provides uh, that if the prosecution wants to use a testimonial statement uh, of a witness uh, and the witness is unavailable, uh, the defendant cannot object on confrontation grounds. He's forfeited his confrontation <coughs> right if he is the cause uh, of, of, of the witness's unavailability. And so the paradigm case, imagine the mobster uh, who, uh, who, who, who uh, at facing trial has, has, has the prosecution star witness killed on the, on, on the night before he's going to testify. Uh, that person cannot go in and, 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 and invoke his right to confrontation. Uh, that rule, uh, I think, is a, is, 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 a perfect, is, an, is a perfect example of originalism in practice uh, today. Uh, because when you look at the history of the right to confrontation, which, as Professor Beavis points out, the Constitution only gives us so many words. What they do is they they, they memorialize concepts that were understood at the time. And the way the right to confrontation was understood clearly at the founding was that it's a defendant's right, but he does indeed forfeit it if he purposefully keeps the witness away from court. Uh, and so what the Supreme Court did in a case called Giles a couple years ago was say that that same historical understanding of the right to confrontation is going to be uh, enforced today as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. On this side, please. Thank you. I'd like to... Uh, I'd like to echo the thanks for a wonderful conversation today. For Professor Bebus, you spoke of the difficulty the right to confrontation creates with regard to medical examiners and, and raised that as, as a problem. With the implications of a murder conviction and with the unique role a coroner has in, in shaping the fact finding and being, in many cases, the sole person capable of testifying as to the cause of death itself, why is that problem? Shouldn't that burden be even stronger in those instances because of that unique nature? Well, I, I guess it depends on what you think the purpose is of confrontation. And I think with fact witnesses, uh, it's pretty clear, it's pretty obvious. Our system trusts uh, looking them in the eye, gauging their credibility, their ability to perceive, their demeanor, any number of things that maybe not as central when you have a witness who is essentially going to be reading a business record and then you get into a discussion of what the general practices are in that coroner's office. Now, I think there's an argument that maybe this ought to be understood as a best evidence type rule, right? If the coroner's available, call him. But there are other ways to prove what the standard practice and procedure of the office was. Does the office have a, a significant error rate? Are there other reasons to question? You can, there are provisions in the rules of evidence for impeaching an unavailable declarant by bringing out that the person had testified falsely, had problems in other cases. There are other ways to get at this when the declarant's unavailable. It just strikes me that, you know, there's costs, there's benefits here, but it's not clear why we should freeze them in amber when it's not kind of the classic the government is trying to circumvent your looking the fact witness in the eye kind of situation. And the history is just not so clear. We have two questions left. And if we do this lightning round style, we can get them both in. So if you would keep your questions and answers short. Yes, I'll be very quick. Um, so the discussion this morning is focused on the Sixth Amendment. And it seems to me that perhaps the Sixth Amendment for originalists is actually a relatively easy case. And then maybe the more difficult amendment is the Fourth. So my question for both of you is how should the Fourth Amendment inform the courts, or how should originalism inform the court's construction of the Fourth Amendment? A short answer to that. Mm. OK. <laughs> Aren't you supposed uh, to see my book or something? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I will say uh, in brief uh, that I, I agree, I think, with something Professor Biba said earlier, which is originalism doesn't always lead to bright line rules. Uh, because originalism is, it has a close cousin in textualism. And when you look at the Fourth Amendment uh, and you see the word reasonable, it's hard for me to believe that the framers meant to freeze in time 
uh, whatever the exact practices were in 1791. Uh, it seems to me to give some measure of flexibility looking forward. Uh, so I think that the practices in 1791 uh, and the historical worries that are behind Fourth Amendment ought to matter. Uh, but I think there ought to be more flexibility in a provision like that precisely because of the different text uh, than in the Sixth Amendment. Right. I, I agree. And it's difficult in a context like Kylo with thermal imaging devices that didn't exist where you draw analogs to whether people could have seen the snow melting on top of someone's house to tell whether it was hot or not. Um, but I do have to say I, one theme on which I tend to agree with Professor Fisher is that sometimes modern judges are all caught up in whether substantively this looks fair or not. But maybe we ought to be doing things like worrying whether the procedures are structured in a way that get us to determining whether it's reasonable or not. And my old mentor, uh, Akhil Amar, who'll talk this afternoon, has written and said, look, the framers trusted juries. You could let juries decide ex post whether a search was reasonable to deal with, well, is it reasonable to hack someone's Facebook account or not? I mean, the framers didn't have an answer, but they would have left it to the jury to figure that out. Or they would have left it maybe to the legislature. Maybe legislatures could come up with, well, what does the average Facebook user think about that? But uh, there are ways short of inventing this exclusionary rule with a warrant requirement that doesn't really fit the Facebook hacking context um, to let the legislature and the juries and other actors develop the law. And so I would suggest that this may not be an area where we want judges coming up with a ton of ex ante rules necessarily, uh, at least until we've gotten an accretion of case law that says, yes, there's a settled consensus in our society that hacking a Facebook account is unreasonable or a drug test in this particular circumstance is unreasonable. That's a reason for deference to the democratic processes to let a consensus evolve rather than freezing it in place, especially with new technologies. Last question. Uh, Professor Fisher, I wanted to ask you about Melendez-Diaz. As someone who did scientific research before I, I went to law school, I'm concerned that some of the <coughs> extension of, of the confrontation <coughs> clause in this ground has to do with confusing what is essentially scientific fact, which is always expressed in terms of probabilities and percentages with more run-of-the-mill opinions or conclusions. Um, but in the interest of, of time, I'll, I'll confine myself to one, one small area. You and Professor Bebas discussed the issue of autopsies, and you suggested that maybe one answer to the question, answer to the problem would be videotaping the evidence. Now, why is that so much better than a written report of the autopsy? Why would that be admissible as, as opposed to the written report when you're going to have the same commentary and conclusions by the, the coroner on the videotape? Oh, thanks for the question. Uh, and, and, I, and I was not perfectly precise when I mentioned that. What I, what I mean is a videotape just like pictures. So that I, I would I would certainly agree I would certainly object to a, a, an audio commentary going along with the autopsy in a way that uh, would violate the confrontation clause just like a report would if the witness weren't present. But pictures or video can be a way of preserving you know here's where the scar is on the right arm so that a new a new a new scientist could be on the stand and say I'm looking at this picture on the video and now I can opine about this. We, I would certainly not let the the original coroner's words come in. Uh, but but that's the kind of creative way uh, to, to, to try to fend off the, the problem that I'm talking about. Let me just say a quick word about your um, your first comment though. Um, that was this that was one of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts lead arguments in Melendez Diaz. Hey these are scientific facts, they're not opinion. Uh, now I hope I can say without any disrespect for the scientific method uh, that uh, that a lot of what goes on in forensic scientists uh, in science is quite subjective. Uh, it, 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 it is, it, 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 and even when it's not, it still depends on expertise and care and analysis in a way that uh, I can't see how it's different than any other witness. And so, again, to draw the analogy that we always, that, we, that I at least advocate doing between the history and the, the past and the present, when a witness says, I saw a blue car go speeding down the street just past midnight, that is an objective, verifiable fact, one way or the other, and I don't. And that's always something we've understood to be subject to the right to confrontation. I don't know how it's any different than the scientist who says, "I've tested, I've tested uh, this powder, and it seems to me to be cocaine." Thank you. Please join me in thanking Professor Fisher and Beavis for their time.